Boston, Massachusetts, the city where a revolution was born, baptized in the blood of five Americans, gunned down in the Boston Massacre. There was no episode like that in America up to that point. Among the dead was Crispus Attucks. The history books claim that his was the first blood spilled in the cause of liberty. His sacrifice actually started a glorious conflict that ended with the birth of this nation. But what if the history books are wrong? What if Attucks was not the first martyr of the revolution? What if the soldiers were not murderers? I think if there's some victims here, it may very well be the British soldiers. What if the Boston Massacre was no massacre, but rather an act of self-defense? Now, we refire the first shots heard around the world. How close is this to a human head? It feels pretty close. An unsolved history. This is the old state house located in the heart of Boston, Massachusetts. Today, it's a national monument, but over 200 years ago, it was a crime scene. This star commemorates one of the pivotal incidents in America's struggle for independence, an alleged atrocity that incited the revolution. On a moonlit evening, on March 5th, 1770, an event took place here. It was known as the Boston Massacre. Eight British soldiers and their captain fired on an angry crowd of colonists gathered in this square. When the smoke had cleared, five colonists were dead. The question then arose, was it murder or was it self-defense? The shootings in Boston were the culmination of a series of violent confrontations between British authorities and colonial patriots that had been building for several years. Sometime between 9 and 10 p.m. on the night of March 5, 1770, British soldiers under the command of Captain Thomas Preston fired their muskets into a crowd of several hundred colonists protesting the presence of British troops in Boston. When the shooting stopped, three people were dead and eight people were wounded, two mortally. In an instant, the colonial world had changed. The Patriots now realized that the struggle for independence would demand blood. When those men died, we knew from that point on that this would be a fight. The only way we were going to rid ourselves of the crown was to fight and die. Sam Adams said it was the most important single action of and including the Revolutionary War. I think everybody realized at once that something terrible had happened. Both sides recognized that it was a terrible thing. Nobody knew what was going to happen. It was a scary time. It was analogous to what happened in this country very recently. It is impossible to overestimate the impact this incident had on the colonies and their struggle for independence. Over two centuries later, the shots still echo. Boston Massacre is really a milestone in the American Revolution. It changed things because people could see that they were, they were on a collision course with the mother country, and uh, this was really the, the flashpoint. If the soldiers hadn't fired at all, there probably <laughs> would not have been a revolution. The Boston Massacre was a turning point in American history. But amazingly, there are still many mysteries that shroud the events of that March night. We don't know an awful lot about the Boston Massacre. Um, there were hundreds of people in State Street, or King Street as it was then, all watching what was happening. And no two people described the events the same way. What little we do know about the shootings is derived from eyewitness accounts, autopsy reports, and contemporary newspaper stories. But these few facts are overwhelmed by questions that remain unanswered. Did Captain Preston order his men to shoot unarmed civilians? If not, why did the Redcoats fire on the crowd? How close were the Colonials to the soldiers? Were the British ever in mortal danger? <laughs> 
Was Crispus Attucks indeed the first American to die in the revolutionary struggle? And most importantly, was the Boston Massacre really a massacre? Murderers! 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 Or an act of self-defense? In an attempt to answer these questions, Unsolved History has assembled an investigative team that will turn the Boston State House back into a crime scene. Law professor Joe McKetrick. Ballistics expert Gary James. Forensic pathologist Dr. David Posey. Acoustical engineer Jack Freitag. And historical researcher Murray Doherty. Our experts will reconstruct the events of March 5, 1770, in order to determine what really set in motion the bloody events that would ignite the American Revolution. We will examine autopsy reports of the victims, eyewitness testimony, and, for the first time, subject a rare diagram of the scene to modern forensic analysis. What we hope to learn from this study is the truth of what happened in the Boston Massacre. Specifically, we're going to look at the murder site, because I think that the accepted history is not the real history here. The Boston Massacre did not occur in a vacuum. Relations between the English Crown and the colonies had been tense for several years prior to the shootings. Great Britain was the most powerful nation on the globe and exploited the natural resources of the colonies in order to fuel her empire. Across the Atlantic, colonists began to resist. A prime breeding ground for anti-British sentiment was Boston. By 1770, the town was a powder keg. The fuse would soon be lit. Geographically, Boston is a small town. Every major event related to the Boston Massacre took place within a half mile of the old State House. But the city was politically divided between loyalist and patriot. And in fact, they lived right on top of each other. Paul Revere, the patriot, lived here. And just a few doors down was the residence of the Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, an avowed loyalist. In the summer of 1768, the British Crown dispatched four regiments of soldiers to occupy Boston in order to keep the peace and collect taxes. The radical patriots did not want to send money to England and escalated the violence. Both sides knew that a confrontation was inevitable. All that was needed was one spark. That spark would be struck on the night of March 5, 1770. Most Americans, everything we know about the Boston Massacre is derived from this engraving. It was created by the famous patriot Paul Revere, five years before his legendary midnight ride. The widely circulated picture depicts a small group of unarmed civilians being cut down by a volley of musket fire. This picture has been reprinted in countless history books and pamphlets and has been the defining image of the incident for over 200 years. But almost everything about this engraving is wrong. The shootings took place at night, not daytime. There was a thick layer of snow and ice on the ground, and the colonists were not the passive victims depicted in the engraving. There was a total of nine British soldiers at the scene that night, not eight, and most importantly, the picture depicts the British Captain Preston standing behind his men. Here, Revere shows his blatant anti-British bias. The witnesses, first of all, placed Preston in front of the soldiers to begin with. The soldiers are lined up very neatly as if they're firing in formation and as if they're being given a signal to fire by the commanding officer. This contradicts the witness testimony. This makes it look like a massacre. We have very little information about the victims of this so-called massacre, but there is one person depicted in the engraving who has achieved a measure of fame, Crispus Attucks. 
Crispus Attucks is probably the most well-remembered name from the Boston Massacre. He was popularly touted as the first black American to die for the cause of freedom. Attucks has gone down in history as the first victim to fall to the British guns, shot at point-blank range as he stood in front of the crowd. But is this what really happened? Even though he was immortalized as the most famous martyr of the Boston Massacre, we actually know very little about Crispus Attucks. Was he a hero or a propaganda invention? It is time for our investigation to begin. On the night of March 5, 1770, British soldiers, under the command of Captain Thomas Preston, fired into a crowd of civilians in Boston, Massachusetts. Five people were killed, and another six were wounded. The incident became known as the Boston Massacre and incited the American Revolution. But was the Boston Massacre really a massacre? Or did the Redcoats fire in self-defense? Did Captain Preston order his men to shoot unarmed civilians? And was Crispus Attucks the first victim to fall? American history turned on the answer to these questions. Questions that have never been satisfactorily answered until now. Appropriately enough, our investigation into the Boston Massacre begins here on Boston Common. In order to separate truth from propaganda, we asked reenactors to reconstruct the events based on eyewitness statements. We need this much space to make this line. By reenacting what witnesses said happened, we can see whether it was physically possible for it to really have happened. When you come in as a mob, you're going to actually be close. Unsolved history can discover where multiple sets of testimony agree and where they diverge. These bayonets are gonna be down live steel. You cannot let your attention drift from the bayonets. We can then focus our forensic team on the places where the witness statements differ. The shooting involved eight British enlisted men and one officer. Our reenactors portraying the soldiers have reproduced as accurately as possible the uniforms and weapons of the period, including this replica of the Brown Bess musket carried by British troops in 1770. As night falls, our reenactors gather in front of the old state house. Unsolved history has arranged to block off this busy city street so we can reconstruct the Boston Massacre at the location where it occurred over 200 years ago. To the right above. Guys. The weather on the night of our reenactment is moderate. But on March 5, 1770, the temperature was unusually cold, well below freezing, and a blanket of icy snow covered the ground. That evening, a sentry, Private Hugh White, was guarding the Customs House, located here. Around 8 p.m., a young apprentice, Edward Garrick, began to taunt White. The taunting continued until White struck Garrick with the butt of his musket. Garrick fell to the ground. Word of the incident swept through the town. A swarm of angry citizens descended on the square. Many of them had been drinking in the local taverns. The angry crowd surrounded the sentry and threatened him with bodily harm. Call out the main guard! While the entire town appeared to be erupting, Captain Thomas Preston was in the main barracks, across the street from the old state house close enough to hear Sentry White call for help. Call out the main guard! Captain Preston marched in with a small group of six privates and a corporal. The British rescue team reached White and attempted to escort him back to the barracks, but they were stopped by a mob of two to three hundred angry citizens. No! No! You must leave! No! No! Hemmed in by the crowd, Preston ordered his troops into a semicircle formation and took a position in front of his men. 
several people in the crowd dared the soldiers to shoot, yelling fire over and over. It made the, the British soldiers feel like they didn't have any courage. You know, they're wanting the fire, they're wanting to answer that call, but they can't. And the crowd knows they can't, so they're daring them. The ugly demonstration turned lethal. When Patriot Richard Palms struck one of the soldiers, Private Hugh Montgomery with a stick. Montgomery fell to the ground, then rose up and fired. Moments later, the Boston Massacre began. The other soldiers let loose with a fusillade of musket fire. Eleven of the Colonials fell. Once they had fired, the mob retreated. So the soldiers reloaded their weapons, and as the mob had come back in to retrieve their wounded, the soldiers thought that the mob was advancing on them to do them harm. They leveled their muskets at the crowd as if to fire again. When Preston saw this, he immediately knocked up their muzzles, yelling, don't fire, stop, don't fire. Preston ordered the men into a column of twos and then marched them back to the main guard. Paul Revere, Samuel Adams, and other Patriot leaders quickly turned the violent confrontation into a massacre, a symbol of British tyranny and demanded justice. Captain Preston claimed that the shootings had been a tragic accident, but it was to no avail. On March 13th, Preston and six of the eight enlisted men were indicted for murder. The lawyer who defended the British soldiers was John Adams, ironically, the same man who would become America's second president. The trial hinged on one essential question. Had the British soldiers acted in self-defense, or did they commit murder? Most of the eyewitnesses to the shootings agreed upon the events leading up to the moment when Richard Palms struck Private Montgomery and Montgomery fired his musket. At that point, however, the discrepancies begin. When Montgomery goes down, there are other soldiers that are witnessing this also. They have to protect themselves, so what do they do? They, they fire back. They, they shoot into the crowd. Um, their intentions are to kill anybody. Their intentions are to get the crowd away from them. After Private Montgomery fired, we know that some, but not all, of the remaining soldiers fired their muskets into the crowd. Some witnesses said that the time between the first shot and the barrage of gunfire was 15 seconds. Others said two minutes. We don't know the interval between the shots. Some people said the guns went off all at once. Some people said they banged at intervals. Clearly, eyewitness testimony is unreliable. How then can we determine what actually occurred that night? Much has changed in Boston since the massacre. But bullets are still bullets, and violent riots still happen. It is time to recreate the events of March 5th, 1770, in a laboratory. On March 5th, 1770, in Boston, Massachusetts, a small group of British soldiers fired into a crowd of colonists. Five men, including Crispus Attucks, died. The story of the Boston Massacre quickly reached mythic proportions as it spread throughout the colonies, fanning the flames of rebellion. The process of turning the massacre into myth buried most of the actual facts of the shootings. It is time for Unsolved History to exhume this evidence in order to determine what really happened on that night in 1770. Most of the eyewitnesses agreed that the incident began when an angry crowd confronted a small detachment of British soldiers in front of the Customs House. The situation escalated when a colonial named Richard Palms struck one of the soldiers with a stick the soldier fired once. What happened next became a key point of contention during the trial of the soldiers. Before the shooting started, the British captain, Thomas Preston, was in front of his men, facing the crowd. 
Some witnesses said that after the first shot, Captain Preston ordered his soldiers to fire. Others said that the soldiers discharged their weapons on their own. If Captain Preston had given the command to fire, then he could be held responsible for murder. The central question raised during the trial was this. Did Captain Preston order his men to shoot unarmed civilians? If he had his back to the soldiers, could his men have even heard a command to fire? To answer this question, Unsolved History went to acoustical engineer Jack Freitag. Freitag turned the question around. Rather than ask if Preston ordered his men to shoot, his team will determine if the soldiers would have even heard the command. We're going to be doing an acoustic simulation of the Boston Massacre. We're going to see if the command had been given by Captain Preston facing the crowd, that is, with his back to the soldiers, and whether or not that could have been heard again in the presence of all the crowd noise. Our team recorded sound in a variety of locations. We also examined maps of old Boston to determine the exact dimensions of the riot area. According to the eyewitness testimony, Captain Preston was standing in front of his men when the shooting started. We will mix our field recordings together and play them back in this acoustically perfect simulation room to demonstrate what the soldiers would have heard that night if he had given an order to fire. We have 32 speakers in all the walls and ceiling and all. On each one of those speakers, we can put a different sound track. We can delay tracks between speakers to make sound sources moving. We can add reverberation, that is delay. We can make the room sound like a very quiet, dead music room with no reflections, or we can make it sound like a cave or a very large cathedral. OK, so the way we set the room up is the soldiers are going to be over there and then the crowd's on this wall. OK, so all of these speakers are the crowd. Very good. And actually, it's the surrounding, so we have speakers all the way around, but we don't really have anything coming out from behind us. Right. Here we go. Since witness reports agree that Preston was facing away from his men, Freitag will assume the same position with his back to the rest of the team. He will then give the command to fire as loudly as possible. We will see if Preston's men could have heard an order to fire or if they might have mistaken the crowd's taunts for the command. Okay. okay. So do we want to do the test with Preston? With, with Captain Preston, okay, yeah, so the second What you're question. about to hear yeah. is a realistic Preston. simulation of what the soldiers would have heard that so, night. So I'll be Captain Preston up there giving the command to fire, and uh, you'll be the soldiers. We'll stand okay. back here and listen. Okay, okay. let's see what happens. Oi, Let me there turn. we go. can't hear anything. Oh, right. Yeah, all I hear it's, is the audio recording. If you're trying as hard as you can, you can kind of hear you fire, but for the most part, it was just really muffled. It's definitely more likely that yeah, they heard the it crowd, from the crowd. Right. Well, now, none of the accounts say that Captain Preston turned around, so he was facing the crowd the entire time. So I think we're, we're pretty definitive here in saying that we, uh, we think it would have been heard from the crowd, and we don't think it would have been heard from Preston. From Preston. Based on our acoustic test, it seems almost impossible that the soldiers would have heard an order to fire. Therefore, it seems that Captain Preston was not responsible for the shootings. But if he didn't give the order, why did his men fire their weapons? According to witnesses, the crowd had taunted the soldiers by daring them to shoot. Did the crowd bring the fire onto themselves? Our acoustic experiment supports that theory. But there are still other unanswered questions about the so-called massacre. No matter who gave the order, the British soldiers contended that they had fired in self-defense. But were they really in danger? What's frequently lost in the Boston Massacre is the fact that the soldiers were in a semicircle with their backs up against the wall of the Custom House, that they were surrounded on all sides, and that the crowd was close in and, and had weapons, had these uh, cordwood sticks. Just how close was the crowd to the soldiers? Can we determine exactly where the victims were at the time of the shootings? Today, in front of Boston's old State House, 
there is a star built into a median. Most people believe that this is where the victims fell. They may be wrong. During our investigation, the Unsolved History team made a remarkable discovery in the rare book collection of the Boston Public Library. A diagram of the scene of the shooting drawn by none other than Paul Revere, the master propagandist. Oh, wow, look at this. A few days after the massacre, Revere made this scale drawing indicating where the soldiers were and where four of the five victims fell. He did not include Patrick Carr because, at the time, Carr had not yet died. Even though his more famous engraving of the massacre is full of inaccuracies, this sketch is considered to be the most exact rendition of the scene that exists. Now, for the first time, our investigative team will subject the diagram to forensic analysis and use it to determine the exact location of the victims. We can take the actual dimensions today and from that we can figure out the, the scale and the relative distances of this chart. The because the size of the State House hasn't changed, it's a reference point between the drawing and present day Boston. If we determine the length and width of the State House, we can use those measurements to calculate the distance from the State House to the bodies. I uh, have 37 feet even. The tools required for this experiment are a laser rangefinder in a simple straight edge protractor. Joe, I read it at 112 feet and one inch. So it, so it looks like almost some of our bodies out here are about 100, 120 feet. Roughly 120 feet. Right. And According to Paul Revere's point. sketch, right. Samuel Maverick and James Caldwell were over 180 feet from the soldiers. That places them at the back of the crowd, on the opposite side of the street. We next attempt to triangulate the location of Gray in attics. The sketch places them in front of the soldiers. That's, that's the approximate position for Gray, right. since he was further from the soldiers, and attics was very close in. So attics would be pretty much, according to the diagram, would be very close to Gray. Right here. Right there. The Revere diagram and the triangulation of the locations of the bodies indicate that the star commemorating the massacre is incorrectly placed. Now, it is time for the Unsolved History team to use ballistics tests to get a more complete picture of what really happened at the Boston Massacre. On March 5, 1770, in Boston, Massachusetts, British soldiers fired into a crowd of colonists and killed five people. Radical patriot leaders like Samuel Adams and Paul Revere immediately leaped on the event and used it as an example of British brutality. It became a massacre because Samuel Adams wanted this thing to be bigger than life. It became a massacre because there were those that wanted to incite the colonists, get their fire going, whip them into a frenzy, and they could blow it all out of proportion and, and, and take it where they wanted to take it. It gave them the freedom to call it what they wanted to call it, and that was a massacre. The history books tell us that the Boston Massacre was an incident in which armed redcoats brutally murdered defenseless colonial patriots. Furthermore, Legend has it that former slave Crispus Attucks had been at the front of the crowd and was the first victim to fall, shot dead by a British soldier firing a musket double loaded with two bullets. But is this what really happened? Did the British fire double loads at the crowd? Was Attucks the first martyr of the American Revolution? We know that no more than six shots were fired by the soldiers, yet 11 men were hit. Two of the victims, Crispus Attucks and James Caldwell, sustained multiple wounds. How could only six gunshots inflict so much damage? Some witnesses claim that the British soldiers loaded their weapons with two balls, one atop the other in the barrel, in order to inflict more damage on their targets. 
Is it possible that some of the victims were shot by two musket balls at the same time, fired by the same soldier? Unsolved History asked our firearms expert Gary James and forensic pathologist Dr. David Posey to fire musket shots into various targets in order to replicate the wounds sustained by the victims. To accomplish this, our ballistics expert uses a special replica of a British musket of the period. It's an exact copy. It's as close as you will ever get to an original early pattern first model brown vest. It's an absolutely gorgeous job. According to the autopsy report, Crispus Attic sustained two wounds in the chest that were at least eight inches apart. The first ball has a wound path which would be described as a front to back and downward path. And then the second ball comes in and also has a right to left in front to back and also slightly downward trajectory and uh, appears to pass directly through his body. In our first test, we will attempt to estimate Crispus Attic's position in the crowd from the Revere diagram and determine exactly how he was killed. Gary James will fire double rounds into targets in an attempt to replicate the eight inch spread of Attic's wounds. You know, it's gonna be acting like a shotgun, so the, the farther away it goes farther away the target, the wider the, the, the spread of the ball is going to be, I'm pretty sure. How can we be sure how the rounds are hitting the target? Unsolved History has the answer. An ultra high speed camera that will enable Dr. Posey to study the gunshots in extraordinary detail by literally slowing down the bullets in midair. We're actually shooting these at 1,000 frames a second. So we get 1,000 individual shots over one second. The whole premise of using high-speed video is to capture something you can't see in real time. It happens so fast that if you blink your eye, you've missed the shot completely. In 1770, there was a very real danger that the barrel of a double-loaded musket would burst if not properly loaded. Over 200 years later, that danger is just as great. James has never fired two rounds from the same musket at the same time. He does not know exactly how the gun will react to the double load until a shot is actually fired. We may end up only doing this once today, we'll see. It could be decidedly unpleasant. Because if you get an air chamber in there, one ball separating from another, you can blow the barrel out. Got it. Gary James fires three times. Each time, the result is the same. The holes are only a couple of inches apart. There's just no spread. Yep, the two ball theory has evaporated. Yeah, I, I think unless he was way, way away. Yeah, I don't think I mean, so. We could go way back and see what happens. I think, you know, we can eventually probably duplicate it, but I think it'd be so far back, it wouldn't, uh, you know, fit the circumstances. Addicts was shot at close range. The ballistics test indicates that at that distance, the bullets from one double-loaded musket would not have spread far enough apart to match the wounds described in his autopsy. I, I think you're right. I think two weapons were used on this guy. He may have been the secondary target instead of a primary target. That would slow the bullet down, too. That would definitely. And then they could have been closer. Then they could have been Dr. Closer. Posey and Gary James conclude that Addicts was shot by two rounds fired from separate weapons. Moreover, the trajectories of the musket rounds that struck addicts suggest that the bullet that hit him may have first hit someone else. According to the autopsy report, one round did not go straight through addicts, but changed direction after striking his body. Could the musket ball have been slowed down or deflected after it hit him? We can test that theory by determining how much velocity a musket ball loses when it passes through flesh and bone. In this case, we will use as the target a slab of beef, approximating the size and consistency of a man's torso. So where'd it go? Yeah. Did some definite damage here. This is the entry wound here. This is about uh, 1.8 centimeters. And the exit wound is much bigger. 
it's about uh, roughly three and a half centimeters. If there's bone in wound path, I think it just crushed the bone and move right on through. I really think uh, he was a secondary target. The slow motion camera reveals that the musket ball easily passes through the target. It is not deflected in any way. As we observed, the musket balls would quickly go through the meat, just like a hot knife through butter. This makes me believe that because of the trajectory of the musket ball, that he had already passed through another target. The only way the bullet could have slowed down enough to be deflected inside Attic's body is if it had already passed through another individual. If this is true, history is wrong. Attic's could not have been at the front of the crowd and would not have been the first man to get shot. Murray Doherty, however, interprets our evidence differently. There's a possibility that those rounds uh, could have hit bone, crushed bone, and, and ricocheted and gone down. And then the bullet's going to change when it comes out. If it passes through, the way it looks when it goes in, it's not going to look that way coming out because it's a soft lead bullet. But if Posey is correct and Attics was not in front, who was? One of the other victim's wounds may provide the answer. Dock worker Samuel Gray was killed by a shot through the forehead that left an exit wound big enough for a man to lift a flap of skin and insert his hand. Gary James and Dr. Posey will attempt to duplicate Samuel Gray's wound using a cassava melon to simulate his head. The melon is the approximate size and consistency of a human head. Dr. Posey will wrap the melon in tape to replicate the tensile strength provided by the skin. Now, how close is this to a human head? Is that gonna give us some indication? Well, it, it, it feels pretty close. I think yeah. uh, it'll give us a good idea when we put the musket ball through what kind of an injury that he sustained. All set. Tell me what, are we ready? Yeah, we're ready. Good. Held together. Yes, yeah. And you look <clears> at the size <throat> of the exit wound here. It's uh, at least four centimeters across. So it, this kind of gives you a real good idea what happened with uh, Samuel Gray's head. Mm -hmm. uh, Gray was approximately, in our test here, we used uh, 15 feet. And very likely, Gray may have been right on top of him. He, he may have been leading the charge, so to speak. Based on the test, Dr. Posey and Gary James conclude that the musket ball that hit Gray was fired at point-blank range. Uh, his, his is the only injury we can account for point-blank, close range, and I think that probably his head was literally crushed by the impact of that musket ball. The results of our tests indicate that Crispus Attucks was not the first person killed at the massacre and he was not at the front of the crowd. Samuel Gray, on the other hand, was shot at point-blank range within feet of the Redcoats. Does this new information prove that the Redcoats acted in self-defense? The fate of the British soldiers would hinge on this question. Our unsolved history investigation into the Boston Massacre has shown that much of what we were taught about this pivotal event in American history is wrong. The massacre was not a massacre, but a riot. The colonials were not defenseless, innocent bystanders, but a rowdy, intoxicated mob armed with clubs and rocks. The British soldiers did not fire a volley in unison, and Captain Preston could not have given the order to fire. In fact, the crowd's taunts may have brought the fire on themselves. But how did history record the verdict? Were the British soldiers justified in firing on the crowd? Captain Preston and the eight enlisted men were charged with murder. A guilty verdict would mean a death sentence. Founding father John Adams defended the British, even though he was an avowed patriot. After enduring two of the longest trials in colonial history, Adams got full acquittals for Captain Preston and all but two of the soldiers. Privates Matthew Kilroy and Hugh Montgomery were convicted of manslaughter. <laughs> 
Preston was acquitted because there was certainly room for a jury, a reasonable jury, to conclude that there's conflicting evidence here. With respect to the soldiers, the question there seemed to become, were these soldiers acting in self-defense? Could a reasonable person fear for his life or fear serious uh, physical injury under those circumstances? So Adams was able to convince the jury uh, that there wasn't sufficient evidence with respect to six of them and with respect to the other two that there was severe provocation and that a reasonable person would have used deadly force to protect himself. Ironically, Adams won Captain Preston's acquittal, not by the weight of evidence, but by skillful legal maneuvering. He outwitted the prosecution by selecting a jury full of loyalists who would vote to acquit no matter what. The defense was careful uh, in the way that a modern attorney would be today in, in terms of jury selection. They had assistants who uh, looked at the background of each of the jurors, and so they, they used those challenges uh, wisely and came up with a panel that they had a great deal of confidence in. To this day, the Boston Massacre remains a controversial issue. Experts can still look at the same evidence and reach different conclusions. Was the Boston Massacre really a massacre or a riot? Was it murder or self-defense? Our investigation suggests a far more complex series of events than anyone at the time could have considered. Episodes in history get names tagged on them, and that's how the short title goes into history. Whether one calls it a massacre or not depends on one's view. Uh, I call it the Boston Massacre because that's what history calls it. The case of the Boston Massacre was, was, was neither murder or self-defense. And the reason I argue this is, is that Montgomery, when he went down, his intentions weren't to kill anybody. His intentions were to fire his musket and, and, and chase someone away. And when you look at that, uh, in that case, it wasn't murder. Is it self-defense? I want to say no, the British soldiers were still not up against a crowd who had weapons. These people had no weapons, though. The worst they had were sticks. So it wasn't self-defense. I believe the British troops were defending their lives at, at the Boston Massacre. They were, they were uh, acting in self-defense. They were threatened. They were out, hugely outnumbered by people with clubs. Uh, if you don't think that someone with a club can kill you or throwing chunks of ice can kill you, then, you know, there's... You need to readjust your view of reality. As for Crispus Attucks, former slave, revolutionary martyr, we will never know conclusively why he went to King Street or how he was shot. But we do know that he was described in almost every witness report as leading the crowd. So what is his legacy? His death let others know that they themselves could sacrifice their lives for a greater cause and that they would be willing to do that because they had already seen it done. Crispus Attic sacrificed his life and he inspired others to do the same thing and they did it from that point on till the end of the war. Were there rights and there wrongs in that incident? Yes, there were on both sides. The taunting of the British soldiers, the provoking of them, um, Montgomery's anger and the discharge of his weapon, the loss of control. Was it necessary for those men to die in order for us to, to gain the courage to stand up for ourselves and fight? Um, I guess no one could really answer that. Um, it was something that happened the way it did, and when it happened, it caused us to be the nation that we are.